Hello, I am Fahad Mian, and this is part four of my series on breaking logic, where I seek to help people see through the mainstream confusion. If you haven't, haven't already seen the videos from the rest of the series, there'll be links in the description. Uh, this particular video will focus on the topic of empathy and uh, not just the psychological part of it, but the societal part of it as well. But what I mean by that is how people in society generally seem to treat empathy or think about empathy or talk about empathy and express the idea of empathy and uh, what people's expectations of it are and their assumptions are. That will include my assumptions as well, being uh, pretty much what I was taught when I was very young, uh, that being that empathy is the ability to imagine yourself in someone else's shoes, i.e. being in their scenario and feeling what they feel. There's a lot of people in my studies who uh, react quite emotionally or immediately to the idea of empathy to say that it's absolutely a virtue and in that process of them saying that they will counter the idea of not having empathy i.e the um, uh, antisocial personality disorders uh, which are loosely said to be uh, narcissism psychopathy and sociopathy when, I, when i've asked these people to go into it and to talk more about um, uh, antisocial personality disorder in a in a broader sense, meaning that well, well you know, what are, what what are those things actually made up of? Those people with those uh, uh, disorders, what are their traits? And do all of those traits actually mean that that person has to be a bad person? Um, and they're very. By and large, most people are very reluctant to to get get their heads around that, or to acknowledge it, or to um, try to um, accept that in any in any particular way. Even though the majority of the uh, institutes of psychology and and most professionals will say that it, those things don't necessarily mean that you're a bad person and that you do harm to the outside world. And my entry point or my fascination with empathy came when I noticed that promotion of empathy almost went, it almost coincided with stigmatizing a lack of empathy. So what I noticed was a lot of people were using empathy or expressing the idea of empathy as an antithesis to antisocial personality disorders. Because by and large, if you read a lot of the descriptions of antisocial personality disorders, right up the top, the main uh, trait of it tends to always be, the first one listed, a lack of ability to empathize. The suggestion that comes to me is that people see the first line of it or the first few lines of the descriptions of antisocial personality disorders and think that the opposite must be true, that the solution to it is to have more empathy. And then they jump on the bandwagon of empathy. Although I've noticed that you do that too much and it becomes problematic. Uh, so I will basically do a re-dissection, a proper dissection of a video that I made previously uh, on empathy, but I didn't do that video justice. I didn't, I didn't break it down completely. So I'm going to do that now. This is a video on YouTube. It's a TED talk um, titled The Erosion of Empathy by Simon Baron Cohen. So we'll read a little bit about him first, just the description of the video here. It says Simon Baron Cohen is professor of development psychopathology at the developmental psychopathology at the University of Cambridge and fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge. He is director of the Autism Research Center in Cambridge. His books include Mind Blindness, The Essential Difference, Prenatal Testosterone in Mind, Zero Degrees of Empathy, and Autism and Asperger's Syndrome. So we will get right into this. 
and go play. Oh, not the end. These two Nazi scientists worked at the Dachau concentration camp during World War II. They were conducting an experiment to see how long a human being could survive in freezing water. Like good scientists, they took systematic measures, including duration until death. Examples of human cruelty of this kind raise a big question. How is it possible to treat a person as a mere object? The traditional explanation for human cruelty is in terms of evil. I find the concept of evil unhelpful and unscientific. It implies that the person is possessed by some supernatural force. Even worse, it's dangerously circular. If the definition of evil is the absence of good, then all we're really saying is he did something bad because he's not good. It hasn't really That's a good point that he's making, that it, it's sort of soft or it goes into like a feedback loop. It doesn't really expand on the topic that much. If you, if you, um, that's, that's kind of the point that I was trying to make in terms of the antithesis thing I was saying, where I've noticed a lot of people will refer to empathy as a reaction to uh, antisocial personality disorders. And they'll create essentially a sensation or a, a idea much on the line, uh, much along the lines of what he's talking about um, in that phrase. You're taking us any further forward. In contrast, the concept of empathy, I'm going to argue, is scientifically helpful. You can measure it, you can study it. Empathy has two distinct components, cognitive and affective. Cognitive empathy is the ability to imagine someone else's thoughts and feelings, putting yourself into someone else's shoes. It's the recognition part. Affective empathy is the drive to respond with an appropriate emotion to what someone else is thinking or feeling. And I'm going to argue that low affective empathy is a necessary factor to explain human cruelty. Okay, so what he's done there is he's split the categorization of empathy itself. So if we, if we go here and have a look at the definition, he hasn't actually defined empathy at all, uh, just, to, just to note this. Empathy, the term empathy is used to describe a wide range of experiences. Emotion researchers generally define empathy as the ability to sense another person's emotions, coupled with the ability to imagine what someone else might be thinking or feeling. So it does seem to me, like if I continue reading on from that and from what he's saying, that the idea of empathy already has been split and different people think quite differently about it. Although I would argue that by and large, the majority of society, the mainstream, tends to think that they agree on what it all is uh, and speak about empathy in that way and assume that another person knows what they're talking about as well with the idea of empathy, not empathy itself, but possibly empathy. Empathy, psychology today. Empathy is the ability to recognize, understand, and share the thoughts and feelings of another person or fictional character. Okay, so what, you, you, I mean, this seems to be the general premise of what empathy is. Uh, empathy allows us to understand and share the feelings of others. So what he's done here with his description, let's just go back. What he's done here, this cognitive empathy that he's talking about is what most people think empathy is. This is certainly what I was taught when I was a child, and certainly from me talking to other people and from the dictionary definitions that we're seeing, that's what 
it seems like empathy is. But the cognitive empathy that he's described is essentially the first part of effective empathy. So this is, this is what it should look like from what he's actually described. People with um, uh, low effective empathy still have empathy. So they, from, from the definition of empathy. So he hasn't defined empathy itself. He's just saying that there are two different types. And if there are two different types, then he should be referring to them as distinctly rather than just saying empathy in a broad manner like the majority of people do. So I'll, I'll go on now. Throw it again. Because he, he's, he's confused it quite a bit from, from what I can tell. That diagram doesn't seem to be accurate and in, in accordance with the definitions of empathy that I've shown you. And he himself doesn't actually tell us what empathy is. So that's problematic there. Empathy isn't all or none. It comes by degrees and there are individual differences in it. So it gives rise to the empathy bell curve. Most of us are in the middle of this spectrum with average amounts of empathy. There are some people who have above average levels of empathy. But what are the factors that can lead an individual to have low empathy, either temporarily or permanently? What are those social factors? What are those biological factors? One social factor is obedience to authority. The experiment by Stanley Milgram at Yale University shows that people are willing to administer electric shocks to someone to help them learn if they're instructed to do so by an authority figure. This suggests that simply following orders may be one factor that can erode our empathy. A second social factor is ideology. When the terrorists flew the planes into the World Trade Center on 9-11, we have to assume that they were in the grip of a strongly held belief that they were doing the right thing. Of course, we don't know whether the terrorists who signed up for that action had low empathy to begin with, but it's possible that their ideological beliefs were another factor that could erode their empathy for their victims. So it, it, could, it could also be the complete opposite of that, because I've heard from interviews with terrorists, the Islamic fundamental terrorists, that their position on going and doing suicide bomb bombings and stuff is one where the innocent people that they kill are too good for this world, and therefore they are sending these people to heaven. So... Now, I mean, is that low empathy or is that a lot of empathy? Uh, it's, it's difficult to say, but he's putting it down at the bottom that possibly it's a lack of empathy. And a third social factor is in-group, out-group relations. In Rwanda, we saw that one ethnic group used propaganda to stereotype the out-group, describing them as subhuman and as cockroaches. When we dehumanize a group as the enemy... So that same propaganda or that same demonization or stigmatization is what I'm talking about with, the, with a lot of people seeming to respond with the idea of empathy or express the idea of empathy as a response to antisocial personality disorder and in the same step, stigmatizing and demonizing people with antisocial personality disorder. We have the potential to lose our empathy and we saw the catastrophic genocide that ensued. But none of these social factors can explain individuals like Ted Bundy he started his adult career as a psychology student at the University of Washington, where he volunteered on a telephone helpline and persuaded women to meet him. And over the successive years, he committed rape and murder of at least 30 women.
We can assume that he had good cognitive empathy because he was able to deceive his victims. But that he lacked affective empathy. He just didn't care. And he lacked... Okay, so he's just said that it's possible for someone to have one form of empathy but lack another form of empathy and therefore they just don't care and serial killer murderer etc so he's he's he himself is saying that you can still have empathy potentially and do horrible things i'll say i'll say straight off the bat right there that means it's not a virtue you can't say empathy is a virtue if someone can still have empathy and then do horrible things and you can still mark them down as having empathy which is essentially what he's done in enduring ways the evidence that psychopaths like ted bundy lack affective empathy so he's classified ted bundy as a psychopath although psychopaths are not meant to have the ability to empathize comes from an experiment by james blair that was conducted in broadmoor hospital he showed psychopaths and the control group three different types of images threatening images neutral images and images of people in distress and what he found was that the psychopaths only showed reduced physiological response when they saw the images of people in distress. So this suggests that they lacked affective empathy. People with autism... Note, have... note here, so far, he's distinguishing, he's creating this distinction between uh, cognitive empathy and affective empathy. Uh, so he's, he's talking about it the way you would expect him to talk about it because of what he uh, originally showed with that that... Uh, uh, chart, although I think what he's describing, he's describing the, the design of the chart was incorrect, I think. Difficulties with cognitive empathy. They struggle to imagine other people's thoughts, their motives, their intentions, and their feelings. But people with autism don't tend to hurt other people. Instead, they're confused by other people and withdraw socially, preferring the more predictable world of objects. People with autism have intact affective empathy because when they hear that somebody is suffering, it upsets them. This leads us to imagine that people with autism and psychopaths are mirror opposites. The psychopath has good cognitive empathy, that's how they can deceive, but they have reduced affective empathy. People with autism have intact affective empathy but struggle with cognitive empathy for neurological reasons. Psychopath Again, he's just spelled it out that you can have a form of empathy and still be a psychopath. So this is, this is his take on it. ...don't come out of nowhere. Many of them have shown antisocial behaviour and delinquency in their teens. John Bowlby at the Tavistock Clinic in London studied delinquents and found that many of them had experienced emotional neglect in early childhood. He argued that the absence of parental love in early childhood is another factor that can erode your empathy. But we know that early experience can't be the whole story. It can erode your empathy? Or, or is he saying erode your effective empathy? He's, he's, he's just used the one phrase there. So, it, it, it doesn't seem to correlate with his, his diagram there, what he said by, by just talking about one aspect of, or talking about empathy as one entire blob rather than distinct things. Because not everyone who has a bad childhood loses their empathy. Absalom Caspi at the Institute of Psychiatry in London showed that if you've experienced severe maltreatment in childhood, that increases your risk of delinquency. But your risk of delinquency goes up even more if you're also a carrier of one version of the MAOA gene, shown here in red. So genes and environment interact 
and another biological factor that is associated with empathy levels is the hormone testosterone. In the fetus, testosterone shapes brain development. We've measured testosterone in the amniotic fluid that surrounds the baby in women who are having amniocentesis during pregnancy. We then wait for the baby to be born and we follow up the children. When the children were eight years old, we asked them which word best describes what the person in the photo is thinking or feeling. Here the correct answer is that he's interested in something. What we found was that the higher the level of fetal testosterone, the more difficulties the child was having on this cognitive, uh, this test of cognitive empathy. How much empathy we show is a function of the empathy circuit, a network of regions in the brain. Here we can look at just two of them. Uh, in red, the left ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and in blue, the amygdala. This is Phineas Gage, who suffered damage to his left ventromedial prefrontal cortex after dynamite blasted a metal rod up behind his eye and through his brain. Before the accident, he was described as a polite, considerate individual. After the accident, he was described as rude and no longer able to judge what was socially appropriate for different situations. He'd lost his cognitive empathy. So I just, just as a thought experiment, I think I'm, I'm going to ask everyone to consider what was socially appropriate in 2019 and Compare that with what is socially appropriate uh, in 2021, 2022. So, just I, I, I just think it's interesting that it appears as though compared to 2019, much of the population in 2021, 2022, in comparison, seem to have become sociopaths by being rude and not... Um, uh, complying or not being able to judge what is socially acceptable based on what was socially expect, uh, acceptable in 2019. Different situations. He'd lost his cognitive empathy. And Jean de Setti at the University of Chicago used brain scanning, functional magnetic resonance imaging, to look at the teenage delinquent brain whilst they were watching films where somebody experiences pain, such as when this piano player's fingers got crushed by the lid of the piano falling down on his fingers. What he found was that teenagers with delinquency didn't show the typical levels of activity in the amygdala, part of the empathy circuit in the brain. He's just calling it the empathy circuit. It could be related to something else. It could be broader than that. That's all I'm saying. But let's not forget the positive side of empathy. Most of us have enough empathy, and some people have high levels of empathy. When these two... So, what, what, what does he mean by high levels of empathy? Does he mean cognitive empathy, or does he mean uh, uh, effective empathy, or does he mean both of them together? Now he's talking about Nelson Mandela. Men formed a relationship based on mutual respect and on empathy. It led to the end of apartheid in South Africa. Empathy is vital for a healthy democracy. How, how does he, how does he just conclude that? It doesn't like, they had a trust in one another. That's, that's a different thing. It ensures that we listen to different perspectives and that we hear other people's emotions and we, we also feel them. Indeed, we know other people's emotions and we feel them. What about reacting to those emotions? He's, he's literally already told us that effect, his, you know, his term effective empathy is something that's important, but he's not mentioned it right here. He's just mentioned feeling other people's emotions and uh, uh, knowing about that person. He hasn't mentioned anything about the response. 
In, without empathy, democracy would not be possible. I met these two women in Cambridge this week when they came to visit. On the left is Siham, and she's a Palestinian woman, and her brother was shot and killed by an Israeli bullet. On the right is Robbie. She's an Israeli woman, and her son was killed by a Palestinian bullet. So just pause it there. We're talking about a blood relative on both, both sides, and it's the same conflict that we're talking about, just opposite sides of the conflict. So all you have to do is like imagine, the, imagine that someone is on, on your side of the conflict and that's it. Otherwise, their scenarios are so are similar enough for there to be relatability, which isn't use of your imagination. That's use of the information that's been provided to you about the other person's situation. So I would argue that what he's presenting here is not a very good example of empathy anyway. These two women have taken the courageous step of forming a relationship across the political divide. They haven't given in to the emotion of revenge, which would simply perpetuate the cycle of violence. Instead, they've used their empathy to recognize that they both share the same sorrow the same awful pain. Let's just keep in mind that empathy is the ability to imagine what another person is is feeling or have, what, what they've experienced. So if, if he's purely talking about empathy here, or to a large degree he's talking about empathy, how, the, how, how is the other person going to know, or how are these two women between one another going to know that the other one had a son killed and one had a, had a brother killed, in, the op in opposing sides of the conflict without them actually talking and expressing or reading about one another and, and relating their experiences rather than imagining their experiences. Of having lost a loved one. Empathy is our most valuable natural resource for conflict resolution. We could wait for our political leaders most valuable resource although you can still have empathy and be a psychopath and kill people to use empathy and that would be refreshing but actually we can all use our empathy as Siham and Robbie told me the conflict won't stop until we empathize okay so that line that is just used there the conflict won't stop until we empathize it mirrors the original statement that he was saying, or the original point that he was making, about not defining evil as an absence of good. So he, he, he had two polarized elements of an argument there, and he's saying, you sh you know, if, you, if you say that one is the lack of the other, then it implies something, it implies the wrong thing. But he's doing the same thing here. So... He's, he's binding conflict with empathy as, as two opposing sides of, of an argument. He's not talking about the distinction, the two different types of empathy and focusing on the ability to recognize it and, and react or respond accordingly. As Siham and Robbie told me, the conflict won't stop until we empathize. Thank you. You notice everyone claps afterwards as well. That was the final note of his TED talk, that the conflict won't stop until we empathize. Meaning that empathy is the solution to conflict. Although someone can have empathy and still be a psychopath. Everyone claps to that, which reasserts it in their mind as the takeaway argument. To, to everything that he's said, even though everything that he's, much of what he's said is contradictory. So he's showed examples that aren't actually empathy, according to our definitions and the definition that he's shown, or the, his explanation, he's shown that you can have empathy and you can still be a psychopath, yet his final takeaway 
uh, message here is that we need more empathy in order to stop uh, um, conflict. So fundamentally, there's a flaw here with his, with, with his argument. What I'm going to do is flip it over to... Here we go. Definitions of virtue. So virtue, as far as, as, far as my... Uh, take on it is that it's something it's a it's a character trait that is ultimately good it, and it's always good you, you can't you like wisdom for example you can't you don't ever hear someone say oh that person's got too much wisdom or that that per person should learn to control their wisdom so uh, definition of virtue moral excellence goodness righteousness um, virtue conformity to a standard of right a particular moral excellence quality or power of a thing a beneficial quality or power of a thing uh, if we have a look for we'll have a look for empath empath we'll just go here Let's find out what an empath is. What is an empath? I'm just randomly looking. Empaths are people who have a higher level of empathy than others. Empathy helps people share experiences, needs, and desires, which in turn can help build relationships. Okay. So have a look at another one. Especially in science fiction stories. Interesting. A person who has an unusually strong ability, ability to feel other people's emotional or mental states. Okay. So we get the idea of what an empath is, like a super, someone with super empathy. So he did, notice, notice that he doesn't actually talk about this in his video at all, that if you have excess or too much empathy, what happens? He's just said that empathy, by and large, will end, you know, it'll stop conflict. Uh, if we have a look at relationship between empath and narcissist am i spelling it right narcissistic this is good enough the dance between the narcissist and the empath resembles a parasitic relationship motivated by the desire to seek love and to heal the wounded narcissist the empath becomes the perfect host to the parasitic narcissist so here we can see that having too much uh, empathy makes you a victim. So in that regard, can, can we say that empathy is a virtue if having too much of it makes you prone to being a, uh, uh, stuck in a parasitic relationship with a narcissist? Being preoccupied with emotionally feeding off others to supply his or her egotistical needs, the narcissist uses tactics of manipulation and control in the relationship. Oftentimes, the narcissist remains in power and the empath feels victimized and powerless. Once the parasite has used up all the resources from the host, it moves on to a new host. Yet, the empath and the narcissist dyad, dual relationship, exists without a dialectic. Without a dialectic. Anyway each needing the other for the dysfunctional relationship to remain intact. Both partners are equally responsible for the unbalance created. While an empath may feel powerless in the relationship, it is important to keep in mind that a narcissist cannot exist without the relationship, with, cannot exist within the relationship without the engagement of the well-intentioned empath. So the empath who has a high ability uh, to feel empathy, strong uh, empathy uh, sensations, uh, tends to, from from what I can see, tends to fall into the, into the category of um, uh, having low effective empathy. From from um, uh, the uh, video that we just saw, based on that, yet he doesn't mention empaths at all. He doesn't mention mention this relationship. That, that seems to occur.
If an empath sets boundaries and walks away, re refusing to internalize the projected feelings of the narcissist, i.e. the narcissist projecting their own worthlessness onto the empath, then the abusive dynamic would cease to exist. So they need to put a boundary. What do they need to put a boundary on? Now, in my previous videos, I've gone in to uh, look at uh, the definitions of words, and I focus quite a bit on the importance of establishing the distinction between subjectivity and objectivity. And this is where this leads us. Now we'll have a look at the definition of empathy as far as Merriam-Webster dictionary goes, because this is really telling. This is really, really, really telling. So they say that empathy is the action of understanding. So saying it is actually understanding. The action of understanding or being aware of or being sensitive to and vicariously experiencing. So it's, it's using the word experience, but vicarious, so a disconnected experience. So you experience the feelings, thoughts, and experiences of another person without having those thoughts, feelings, and experiences fully, communi fully communicated in an objectively explicit manner. Right? Now I'm going to... In a second, I'm going to cut out all the buzzwords out of there and get down to the logic of that, right? But then the second definition, which is basically a revision of a, a, a summarized revision of the first one, um, reads the imaginative projection of a subjective state into an object so that the object appears to be infused with it. So with that definition, I, I cut out the emotions, feelings, and all that kind of stuff and just sort of shortened it up and just put things there and them, right? The action of understanding, being aware, or being sensitive to, uh, and vicariously experiencing things without them being fully communicated in, a, in an objectively explicit manner. Now, the second definition is there as is. And what, what, we, what we've got here is we've got a... a, a a fusion of, of a few different ideas which you wouldn't expect to be fused. Um, they should really be considered and spoken about as distinct. Yeah. So you've got the imag you, you you've got something that you've imagined, you've got something that you've understood, and something that you've experienced. Yeah. So if you merge all those th th three things together and assume that something you imagine constitutes understanding and it constitutes an actual experience, what, what, what's going on there? What is that? So they're implying or inferring here that empathy is the fusion of objectivity and subjectivity rather than the distinction, being aware of the distinction between it. Uh, so in that regard, I don't think empathy can be a virtue at all. I th as I said previously, knowing the distinction between whether you can or cannot empathize, knowing that that difference between your imaginative state and the state of someone else's actual being is vital to prevent delusions. If, we, if our imagination and reality becomes fused and confused, then we get delusion. We can't tell the difference between imagination and what's actually happening out there. And that's what this is spelling out for us. And it just alarms me, and I, and I see it as quite irresponsible, that uh, Simon Baron Cohen, uh, professor of developmental psychopathology, ends his TED talk by saying that the conflict won't stop until we have more empathy. When essentially what he's talking about, if we say more empathy, more empathy, more empathy, is more victims and less of a distinction between objectivity and subjectivity. So be confused more about your imagination and reality, have more delusions, and we need more victims, is, is the direction that his talk seems to be pushing us in.
Now, his uh, Simon Baron Cohen, his cousins with Sasha Baron Cohen, who is prominent Hollywood elite, is who he is. And I know from my experience with people in the Hollywood and the broadcast industry is that there's a hell of a lot of victimhood going on. Not There's a lot of vi uh, people who become victims to abusive people in there. And for him not to consider this, then you can be a victim in this industry that, that his cousin is actually in. Uh, his cousin includes actor and comedian Sasha Baron Cohen. So I know I've had people in the Hollywood industry who work on productions openly tell me about the, the directors they're working with being pedophiles or them seeing on set inappropriate behavior towards children. And the whole uh, saga with um, uh, that Weinstein guy, um, Harvey Weinstein, uh, there's a lot of bad stuff that goes on for the purpose, seemingly for the, for the superficial purpose of trying to help people and trying to do good. Uh, so people people fall victim to it. He should know this. Baron Cohen here should be responsible for actually expanding more clearly on the breadth of empathy and, and the problems with empathy uh, because he's related to someone in the industry who, who, and it should be of utmost concern to him, but he doesn't mention it at all, which is extremely bizarre. Um and from what I from what I can tell, there it, it takes a lack of self awareness and a underlying underlying pattern of self defeat or self sabotage. So lack of self awareness, self sabotage, self defeat correlates with this excess empathy the problem the problems with having heightened sense of empathy and we're pushing people in that direction by saying we need more empathy we need more empathy and everyone <laughs> laughing and every, everyone clapping and applauding at the end of being told that without realizing what they've act, what they're actually being told um and the only conclusion that i can come to theorizing this is that there would be an unclassified mental health disorder being hidden under the virtuous label of empathy. If we do ignore the problem with having too much empathy or thinking that you have too much empathy and not realizing it, um, not realizing that it's just your imagination, then that's extremely problematic. I would, I would wager that, that we're, we have an unprecedented, huge amount of mental health issues hidden under the banner of a virtue, i.e. empathy. And it's unclassified, undiagnosed, very difficult for people, people to get to the bottom to, to the bottom of. Um, and I, I can go deeper into the creation of the DSM-3 uh, mental health diagnostic handbook, which is used around the world. That creation of that guide was extremely problematic. Um, it, and, and the methodology that they used was so arbitrary and not worth the outcome that, that people are following in terms of categorization in this way that it's problematic. And one example, I'll, I'll link it. There's, there's an interview um, from a guy who wrote a book about a bunch of interviews he did with the, um, the panel of experts who... Uh, were put in charge of creating DSM-3 in, in the early 80s. And in one example, uh, one of the committee members asked or requested to have a particular symptom underneath a, a, a certain mental health uh, diagnosis. She requested to have that symptom removed because she had it because that reminded her of herself and that particular symptom or character trait was self-sabotage and self-defeat and 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 having this underlying sensation or underlying subconscious feeling that gets you trapped in these situations 
where you only do harm to yourself, not directly, but indirectly. Um, and that was removed. And the last time I looked it up, there was a mental health classification, which was predominantly about self-defeat and, and self-sabotage, but it's been scrapped. It's, it's, it's not a classified mental health disorder. And I would argue that this is what we're actually looking at would combine in terms of an, an unclassified mental health disorder being hidden under a virtue. What we're looking at is a combination of a lack of self-awareness, um, low self-esteem and uh, uh, traits that uh, result in self-defeat or self-sabotage, among other things, uh, uh, while projecting your virtues, projecting your compassion and your love. So on the surface, you're acting on love, but you're bringing yourself harm by not being aware of the outcomes of your actions. Uh, so I, I would wager that, that, that there's just something sinister going on here. It's just, it's my guess, my assumption that he should, he should be a lot more, Simon Baron Cohen should be a lot more responsible in the TED talk that he gave in outlining more aspects of empathy so that people know where they sit. He started, I think he started off okay, even though the chart seems to be incorrect and he didn't actually define what empathy even was. Granted, it's a 10, 15 minute TED talk, but within that TED talk, like I shouldn't have to do more reading into what this guy thinks or says or anything. If he can't, con if he can't, you know, converge everything he, he thinks about the subject into a 10, 15 minute TED talk, if he couldn't put it all, you know, responsibly into a 10, 15 minute TED talk, then he shouldn't be giving the TED talk. It's as simple as that. Uh, so this is a huge problem. It's a huge problem. And it's part of the reason why I want to uh, uh, get a new standard of dictionary going where children from a young age can practice their cognition and their awareness of objective and subjective elements in, in communication and thought and scenarios. Um, I want to, you know, I want to make sure that the, the children of our future are, are concentrating and being aware of and, and being mindful of uh, that distinction and, and to prevent them from falling into parasitic relationships and becoming victims. So that's, that's my take on it. Uh, thank you for listening. And uh, I even looked up on Wikipedia anyway the definition of a virtue, and I couldn't find empathy in that. So I, th I think a lot of other people are saying uh, or coming to that conclusion that empathy isn't actually a virtue. It can be a good thing, but you've got to be careful. You know, you've got to be, you got to combine it with other things. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I don't think I'm alone in, in, in thinking this way, although by and large, it, it, it seems as though most people in the mainstream seem to think or feel that empathy is a virtue and it can't do any wrong. You can't, you can't go wrong with empathy, 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 whereas you clearly can. Thank you for listening. I hope that's all food for thought and consideration. Um, peace out.